Hello, I'm Holly Lindley, and I'm here with Roger, Chris, and Mary Ann. And um, we're going to really focus on kind of advice for making inferential reasoning kind of a natural part of our practice. And I'd like to start out with a question about how, what do you consider to be the difference between informal and formal inferential reasoning? And I'm going to start with you, Mary Ann. Okay, great. Um, so informal inferential reasoning is something I've thought a lot about, as it turns <laughs> out. Um, so w the way I would characterize it is that we're not going to end up um, with the p-value, which is like um, some kind of formal measure of how likely or unlikely something is. We're just going to reason um, about the data. We're going to reason with visualizations and data displays, and we're going to coordinate some key concepts. We're going to coordinate um, concepts related to measures of center, variance, we're going to look at the shape of the data, um, and we're going to look at all the relevant aspects of the data to formulate some kind of prediction or conclusion, which of course we can't ever prove, right? Um, so it's just reasoning and kind of putting together the key elements of the data um, that pertain back to the context and the question that's being posed. So not all the data is important every time, and I think that's hard sometimes for teachers yeah. and students and everybody to um, kind of reconcile with. You might have a question that's posed that's focused more on variation, and so you'll care more about the variation in the data. You might have one that's more about comparing measures of central tendency. Um, you might have one that's focused more on the shape of the data. Um, so you want to tend to different elements, coordinate them together to come up with some kind of um, some kind, something, some kind of generalization about the data right. um, beyond the data at hand to a, a wider universe. Uh, so formal to me is you run, run a hypothesis test or maybe conduct a stimulation um, using technology to mm -hmm. generate a probability distribution, and so you're ending up with some kind of number at the end that you can report um, in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, what the likelihood is of, of something being true or not. So informal, I think, is just is more reasoning and trying to make sense of it without the numerical um, answer at the end. But you might use statistics to get there. You might use medians and means and yeah. uh, measures, right? You might use measures. Um, the last thing I would say is that, of course, it can't involve um, local comparisons. It needs to be global, right? Global comparisons of data distributions, and that's hard at times. So for teachers just starting off on this, if you have students who are reporting on specific data values that probably isn't that probably is an informal inference so sometimes I think it's hard to tell um, where to draw the line like is anything a student says about the data is that is that informal inference mm -hmm. how do I know right. when I've got one versus when we don't right and so I think it's it's looking at um, the data distribution characteristics. Right, right. right. So, so instead of kind of calling out some of those special cases yes. and those outliers of, well, you know, there was one boy that, that was so much faster yes. than all the girls, so boys right. are faster. That's right. You know, you will hear that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know that, no. that they have to start, re they ha in order for it to be inferential reasoning, they need to be considering the whole data distribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking for trends right. yeah. and, uh, and aggregating those ideas. So. Right, right. So would you like to stem from that? Like the yeah, difference between kind of informal I, I, to formal? Yeah, more at the university level. Uh, one of the things that I guess I think of is the understanding of the process to, you know, how would you think about uh, the statistics? So if you are wanting to make this comparison, what would be an appropriate simulation mm -hmm. kind of thing so that you really have, even if you're not going to conduct a formal hypothesis test or do something like that, if you just wanted to look at it and say, is this something that would happen by chance, how would you build that distribution? Mm -hmm. And that's something that sometimes, you know, we don't want to go to all the, you know, uh, calculation details and do all of that. We just want to look at it and say, okay, mm -hmm. convince me. Right. Uh, you know, even if I'm not going to go anywhere with that, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to publish this result or anything like that, just convince me that this value is not something that would happen by chance. Well, how do I build that? Right. Yeah. Right. I can't. I can't add anything yeah. to this. This is, <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, I think the only thing I will add, just to connect it back to the standards, uh, 
when we discussed in a previous video about this idea of meaningful difference when we were comparing groups uh -huh. at the middle school level, to me that was the intention of the writers of the standards to try to help students at a very early age get into this role of informal inference where they're using graphs and they're not going to p-values or they're not going to margins of error. Right. Come up with convincing arguments using your measures of variability and center as to whether this is meaningful or not. Yeah, and right. then once you advance up to where you're using simulation or using formal probability distributions and you get these measures like margins of error or p-values, uh, then I always like to say you're thinking about is, is there a meaningful difference versus is it statistically different? Yeah. You know, as, yeah. as a way to distinguish the informal from mm -hmm. the formal. I do think it's interesting though that some people think that using simulation and coming up with p-values is informal. I was going to I was just going to ask that question. And, and I actually <laughs> just say, I, I feel like that even with simulation, once you get to that point of coming up with simulated p-values, yeah. or if you're bootstrapping, right. Right. and you right. come up with margins of error, I consider agreed. that formal nope. inference. Right. But yeah, some people will tell you that you need to be using the, more, the theoretical distributions right. mm -hmm. more to be formal. So I think there's not a necessarily an agreement on mm -hmm. what's informal and formal. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. No, yeah. I do think that if you're actually coming down to, hey, I got a p-value from this, even if you get that mm -hmm. null distribution. It's an empirical p-value. Right. It's right. Uh, it is formal, but if you are really, it, I think it's the motivation, right? Are you right. trying to convince everybody mm -hmm. or are you just trying to understand it yourself and understand Mm -hmm. in a more you know uh, uh, fundamental way is right. there something going on here right that that's maybe where i would draw that line mm -hmm. why are you yeah. doing this inference and, and what one talking. of the things that i try to think about is a, is a differing is going from some of the situations that you described um is that the difference between are you um are you thinking about just the data that you have at hand and convincing us from that? Or are you imagining that data coming from some repeated process? Mm -hmm. yeah. Some sampling process yes. that happens again. Because if you're thinking about it as it coming from a repeated process, mm -hmm. Then we're then going to be looking at the um, the sampling distribution of, right. of yes. what, what what happens from that repeated process, mm -hmm. and so I think I like to consider that as a a, a, a nice step between informal to formal. So what advice would you give to teachers who are really trying to kind of scaffold? I think some of that has been coming out in our conversations, but you know, if you could just briefly say one piece of advice so that teachers really give those students the opportunity to develop their inferential reasoning, what would you say? Calculations are not the important part. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. Yeah. I, would, I would also say to hold off on box plots without the raw data for a long time mm -hmm. to our middle school friends uh, because we want to look at the raw data and we want to mm -hmm. have that and be able to reason from it. Now you mm -hmm. could overlay box plots on raw and data. Plots, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and dot plots. Mm -hmm. You could, yes, box plots on top of dot plots. Um, but you don't you don't want it to turn into procedures. So right. a lot of times if you mm -hmm. use box plots, people have rules perhaps that they've heard, you know, if I have a quartile that's shifted over, you know, one, one, one more than the other box plot. Now I have a significant difference. We don't want to reduce statistics and, and reasoning and inferential reasoning down to comparison that student could memorize and, <laughs> right. and just right. replicate without thinking about the data and the shape and the differences. So yeah. allowing students to explore data, allowing them to see the raw data, allowing them to ask all those questions uh, that might seem irritating at first about the data, uh, but just having those discussions and taking time um, mm -hmm. to talk about the data, look mm -hmm. at the data, and really explore it and understand it, um, you'll be surprised by what your students can do. Mm -hmm. yeah. It kind of gets back to, uh, in professional development, I have a colleague uh, that has taught me so much in terms of how to work with teachers and professional development. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we are getting ready to do tasks, she always starts out with, I wonder. And she spends time mm -hmm. with the teachers and just, let them see the scenario that they're going to be looking at with the task before we do anything else. And just let the teachers or the students, yeah. oh, well, I wonder, I wonder, did they do this? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and, yeah. and it's, it's amazing how powerful that discussion is because it gets them into the context right. of the situation. It sort of gets them into the data. Right, and the curiosity. And the curiosity yeah. of it. I would like to say one more thing that I've found, and this kind of gets back to when we were talking about modeling. Mm -hmm. um, 
One of the things that I've learned is that it's really important to let students just try different models. I don't I think our tendency as teachers is to just tell them how to set up the models right. because it's easier, but it's worth the time for them to try to set up models yeah. that don't work because it's through that process that they really understand what that null hypothesis is representing right and and the, the scenario and what they're just just what am I trying to model where am I trying to get with the sampling distribution so I can make those inferential mm -hmm. statements mm -hmm. so I and sometimes you might have to help them. You may have to scaffold, scaffold them some. But that, I found, is, is really critical. Right, right. Well, my friends, you guys are a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. And I think you've given us some great advice. And uh, I think our teachers and our participants have learned a lot from our experts here. Thank you.